This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with a longtime friend, David Smick. And David and I are here to talk about an extraordinary project that he's just realized. His film is called America's Burning. And in the tumultuous election season, where the world is in distress, where the confidence in every institution in America is diminished, David has stepped forward to, as I, how'd I say, I am the son of a physician, to diagnose and find remedies for that which is haunting us. Dave, thanks for joining me. Rob, it's great to be with you. Yeah, we've been uh, buddies since, I think it was 1984. Yeah, and, and uh, it, it's... When we, we were both three years old then, and now we're... <laughs> That's right. And uh, we'll, we're almost going to be 21, so maybe we, uh, you know, we can get a little champagne to celebrate your movie. I was once in <laughs> Texas at a dinner party, and, the, uh, and somebody said uh, they were turning 75. And I said, oh, really? I said, I'm turning 40 soon. And the, and the, woman, the woman looked at me, and she said, you're 40? Well, you live the hard life, son. <laughs> I said, that's a good line. I'll take that line. That's pretty yeah. funny. Anyway. Yeah. Well, coming to your film, you talk about a hard life. You've had a very <clears throat> successful life in many, many dimensions. And yet, I think some of the hardness of growing up in Baltimore may have played a role in inspiring you to dig deep and examine what's happening to the United States of America. But why don't you tell me, where did this come from? My background is, uh, for the last 37 years, <clears throat> is in um, the financial markets. I have a, a company that advises <clears throat> mostly hedge fund traders in macro global macro policy. Uh, my first client was George Soros, as, as you know, and, and then um, that I had, you know, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, a lot of international clients, um, and everything you know, was fine. It's ironic that I'm in that role <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a financial advisor since I, I grew up in a heavily blue-collar neighborhood in Baltimore, or as we call it, Baltimore. Uh, and uh, my next-door neighbor was just drove a cement truck, and my best friend's father was a plumber, and he today is a plumber. It's a, uh, I, I grew up in a working class environment and somehow I chalked it up to the American dream, but I managed to, to make it to, um, to a significant uh, advisor on, 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 the, on the Wall Street stage. So the question is, um, how did I end up doing a movie? Well, I had done several New York Times bestselling books. One was called The World is Curved, which kind of anticipated the financial crisis, but I was but um, books are limited in terms of the outreach. Uh, the people you can read, there's only a certain number of people who read a book about nonfiction subjects. And so um, I thought about this idea of a film because I looked at um, the discussion about today's hate and division and why we hate each other, why we're so divided. We can't, contempt. We can't even stand to talk to each other in some cases. And I looked at that and, and, and I looked at the discussion of you know, could we enter a civil war even, you know, that has been rolling around. And I began to think that, um, you know, the, um, the reasons I'm hearing for why we're so divided are not satisfied. I mean, they're, they're, some of them are relative, are, 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 some of them are relevant, excuse me. But um, I said, the reason that, that I, I looked around, and I said, I think the large part of our, not the only part, but a large part of our reason for our division is economic. And it's the, um, it's the, it's the, the shrinking of the middle class and the, and the breakdown and dying of the American dream and the whole issue of social mobility, which has, uh, if you look at the last 40 years, it's the 40 years that I've lived through professionally, these have been the greatest years of our life. I mean, financially, I mean, you're, we've all experienced that. Um, uh, uh, the markets have just been explosive. If you look at 1980, the Dow Jones Industrial Average went from 
800, and it suddenly oh, between that point and now a 3,800% return. If you look at wages, 16% according to the St. Louis Fed, real in, in, in adjusted for inflation. And you, um, so you have a large, you have the people that I grew up with who are feeling cut out because, you know, during this incredible bull market, if you didn't own stocks, you weren't invited to the party. And uh, so about half the country wasn't part of this stock, re, uh, explosive stock market rebound. And uh, it just dawned on me that, that that is a, you know, that's a problem because people are angry. And they're angry in some ways because they feel alone. They feel cut off. And they, you know, they don't want somebody dropping the check from the helicopter they want the American dream back. They they want that, and they they know that uh, the U.S. They may not phrase it this way, but once had the it had the, uh, the the highest rate of social mobility in the industrialized world, and now we're near the bottom. And so, you, you if you don't believe, you know, people sit around and talk about, oh my. Our democracy is at jeopardy. Well, it is in jeopardy. And, and the biggest risk to our democracy is the death of the American dream. Because if you don't believe, if you're a blue-collar worker and you don't believe that your child or your grandchild is going to have a shot at getting ahead, forget it. You're not going to you're not going to fight for, for for American democracy. You're not going to care. You're going to say, what's it done for me? So... Well, China is not a democracy, but there was a, an old parable that a country does not undergo revolution because how it impact, impacts you. It undergoes revolution when your children and grandchildren have no future and that your responsibility for the, the people right. you love is what drives you to that edge. Right. And uh, I think at this juncture, when you look at how much college education costs, when you look at the idea that you might be a junior having paid almost $100,000 a year, and now they're going to bring in AI and replace you, yeah. there's a whole lot of fear, not yeah. very far from the surface. Yeah. And I and would say, yeah, the, well, go ahead. I was going to say, and the, and the faith in compensation <clears throat> for bad outcomes or surprises or innovations that displace you. Nobody has much confidence in that either. Yeah, I, I, I am um, convinced that um, capitalism needs to be restructured, needs to be fixed. I'm not of the mentality. This is not the Bernie Sanders. Let's indict the system, throw it out. And the reason is the system's too powerful. The, 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 the money corruption, it's just not going to happen. But I think we can make changes. And I think uh, that um, if, if, with the elite powers that be, that's, it, you cannot have a system that where large parts of the, of the uh, population are, are cut out of the, of, the, of, of, of the party. And I think that's, that's a big part of this film. I, I did the film... Because I, I felt this kind of uh, sense that all the people that I grew up with have been cut adrift. They, 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 it's like a velvet rope society of brains and money has cut them off from from the rest of from you know from society. And they, um, so I, I, I think we, our leaders in Washington, both parties have completely botched this. They've ignored. And uh, um, this the sense of uh, opportunity, this American the, uh, dream concept that it would apply to everyone, not just to the, the affluent elite, affluent kids who, uh, you know, already have an edge to get into the Ivy League. So they're going to I'm talking about everyone. So. Yeah. Well, it's like the famous uh, movie from last year, Holdover, yeah. where Paul Giamatti is a professor who had dropped out of college, but he's a professor at a prep school. And he shepherds the children 
who have to stay on campus during the Christmas holiday. But he ends up getting into entanglements with the wealthy parents, not because the children aren't getting good grades or learning from him, but he steps up to the difference between a quality education and what you might call plutocratic purchase right. of admission to college or I, admission. We had a screening and uh, we had several screenings in Hollywood of the film and the writer of the, of that film, the holdovers was there and it was uh, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, your script and my script are almost parallel. He said, it's, <laughs> I, I sat there, watched your film. I was shocked. He said, it's, it's, it's parallel. By the way, I should mention yeah. the, um, the film is executive produced by two Academy Award winners, Barry Levinson and Michael yes. Douglas. And Michael Douglas is the narrator of the film. But they are not, yep. they are not uh, doing this for compensation. They're not doing this passively. Both of them were heavily involved and, and, and particularly yeah, giving yeah. me advice. Michael Douglas just spent you know, a week doing media to promote the film. We had our, op you know, our opening in New York, our premiere in New York. And, um, uh, they, I, and people ask me, why are they doing this? These guys can do anything. You know. And you ask them, they're worried about their kids. They're worried about the graduates. But there's also a big part of the film that... <clears throat> that deals with uh, the hatred and the division that, um, and how, how, to, you know, how do you respond to contempt? And a big part of the, uh, of the answer was provided you know, in the film by the Dalai Lama. He said, if you feel contempt for someone, try to, try to fake it, fake that you actually like them. And he said, it's part of the human brain that that's the way to, to, uh, to our recovery is to, uh, and, and so there is a cer certain um, Arthur Brooks in the film calls it a revolution of the heart that says as a country, we have to, or as you say in the film, and you, you provide some of the uh, remarkable insights uh, that, we, that, that this film offers, uh, that there's a spiritual democracy. And the spiritual democracy is based on uh, the belief that what's really important is the common good. It's 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 mm -hmm. it's, it's it's not material possessions, but um, I right. think of the, uh, Leon Panetta makes a point in the film where he uh, he um, Obama's defense secretary. He says, you know, um, the Tocqueville when he came to visit the United States, um, he was shocked that because people in the U.S. cared about each other in a way that they didn't see in Europe. And so that is, um, um, that's what, that's the spirit that we once had, a spirit of community. And I, th I think that's a, that's a part of it. Part of coming back to it, economic sanity is a, is, is, a, is going to be a huge element. You cannot have, think about this, a 3,800% return for one crowd and a 16% wage gain for that. That is, you can argue, well, that's a good point for the liberals, or that's a point for conservatives. That is not liberal or conservative. That's just common sense. How can you have a, a democracy with that kind of a, of a, of a situation? It's a structurally a problem. So my, my, the question I say is, um, since we're not going to beat the system, we can say we can. I mean, we have two presidents. One, Donald Trump and, uh, and Joe Biden, who both promised to eliminate the carried interest, egregious carried interest loophole for the private equity industry. And they both said, that's going to go. That's outrageous. In other words, you can, be, you can own three dry cleaning units under a, you know, a corporate subchapter C, and, and you're going to pay a much higher tax rate than one of the big private equity out outfits on Wall Street. It's insane. They should all pay the same. And uh, But, you know, we have this situation where uh, we're not going to beat them. What we need to do is figure a way that we can invite a working class to join the financial party. And I think it, 
there, there, there are a number of things you could do, but uh, to me, the, the, the most important thing is to is education. I think every child should not be allowed to graduate from high school without taking a course in money. I used to say finance, but actually money, where they learn about money. They learn about how the system works. They learn about the, the miracle of financial compounding. They learn about saving and investing. So they, they, they're part of this. The second thing is I think every child at birth should be given a, 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 a stock account. I'm calling it baby bonds, but it's a, an account that's invested in, mostly in stock index funds. You could have six options. Warren Buffett, Buffett can pick one. You could have others pick, and the public then has – so the child has the option of having a piece of a stake in the future of the country. And you give each child a $10,000 loan payable with interest in 50 or 60 years. By that point, given the miracle of financial compounding, these, these people will be millionaires. And they, particularly if they can add to that fund as they start to see it grow and they start to realize that they can be part of this system. If you can't bring them in, then they have no future because, as you point out, AI – other technological breakthroughs are going to no doubt eliminate jobs. And so you're going to end up with a, a population that's living on a guaranteed income, but they're not happy. They have no sense of, um, of, of, of they look at themselves in the mirror and they say, you know, I don't really feel good about myself. I used to feel good. I had, I, I, I provided a service or I made a product and now I don't. And I think that's where we're going. We need to figure a way that they can say, okay, we are part of this, this system. I also think, you know, we've got to save the middle class. One way to do that is to um, take part of the, the carried interests of the, of the wealthy private equity giveaway and, and say, look, if you give up part of that, not on the whole thing. It's just part of it. We can beef up the earned income credit. Well, we can do, you know, but things like the earned income, and we, we can provide a safety net so you people, so middle class families, working class families don't slip down below that. And that's what's happening now. Nobody notices. Oh. So. Yeah. Well, how would I say it feels like the echoes of L. Frank Baum's novel. Yeah. The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Everybody went to the city. Everybody went to finance, whatever. And then they say there's no place like home. <clears throat> and they they want to be back in their roots. Yep. But right now, everybody's being what you might call shaken up or fearful or displaced by things changing. And, of course, even this past year or so, when SVB Bank is bailed out, the echoes of the great financial crisis where – the too big to fail banks were all protected and all kinds of people were not. Right. And there, there is a great deal of suspicion about who the government is working for these days. Right. And you can see that in the Gallup polls about all the different institutions, whether it's related to health care or the Federal Reserve or the Senate, the Supreme Court, the House, the president, the media. There's everything's dropped off like 20%. Yeah. yeah. James Carville, who's, who's in our film, uh, James Carville he calls it Washington's become a racket. He said, everybody's bought. He's very, he's very blunt and direct about it. But you know, when you, when you look at and see the kind of influence that um, companies have today in terms of writing their own legislation, in terms of setting up, protective mechanisms to keep competitors out. I mean, it, you say, why, why isn't there more opportunity as a result of, of um, uh, for the average person? And, you know, we used to be, uh, you know, the old, the old adage was 30 years ago, or we, 25% of the economy um, would rise up and achieve um, to that top 25%. And then above that, there would be a 5% winners at the top. Now that 5% is 1%. And you say, why? But there, if you don't have the same opportunity, I mean, I, I say in the film, 
in the 60s, we had, from a standpoint of productivity and efficiency in the economy, we had a Ferrari economy in the 70s and 80s. Or the 80s and 90s, we had more like a Porsche economy. And now we have a Segway economy. We, we, it doesn't, it's not to blame any candidate or say, this has been coming on for a long time, but we don't get the, the kind of productivity increases unless we're measuring productivity. We're, that's a disturbing fact when you look at the low productivity. Why? And, and you can't, you can't ignore the fact when you're not having the productivity, that you want because the system is bought, you know, and just look at the, when you have both parties brag, they, they brag and they say, Oh, look, what did it, what, what, look what we've done. We just got one of our big hot shots to give us $20 million. As if there's no strings attached to that, you know, the string is always, how do we keep a competitor down? And, uh, you know, we always look, we always look at uh, Bill Gates, this geeky young Bill Gates with his Seattle firm, Microsoft, and you say, wow, you know, he topples IBM, mighty IBM. Could that happen today? Probably not, because the, the, the lobbyists would be completely different 30 years later. They would be, uh, they would be in a uh, much more sophisticated, much more control. Um, I think in, in the film, um, the head, former head of Google says uh, the public would be shocked, shocked to know the degree to which corporations write the legislation affecting them in Washington. Even foreign governments through the lawyers write legislation, and it's insane. And I, I, I'm, uh, I think everybody kind of knows that, but, but people are afraid to do it because if you're a member of Congress, you say, I spend 70% of my time raising money from these sources to keep my seat. There's something wrong with that system. You know, I have spent 70% of my time, or if you're, if you're in the House, I spend two days a week in Washington where they jam all the legislation into a short period of time. Then I go home, and it's all fundraising. And that's it's just insane that, that we're, we have a system that, doesn't allow these people to do productive work throughout the week to work five days like every other American. And, uh, but I, I think that there is, there's a corruption. I call it a legal corruption in Washington that is killing the American dream. It's killing it. And because the, the uh, I know in the tech world, people they're very bright. They get out of a, a Stanford or, or one of the other MIT, and they have an idea for a company. And their whole, I, the whole thrust of their, their, uh, the, uh, of their starting out, they, they don't expect to build the company. They want a billion dollar buyout because if they, if the company looks, it's a brilliant idea and it looks like a threat, and they start to set it up, they want to be able to sell it to one of the big guys the big tech firms who will buy it, give the guy a million bucks, kill the, and kill the, kill the startup because it's a threat. And so, you, I mean, hundreds of these companies that we could have an even more powerful tech sector if we weren't allowing these guys to uh, destroy the incentive by, you know, using, using the mass liquidity in today's uh, economy to, you know, with this ocean of liquidity where they can they can come in and distort the market using um, um, their their wealth to to eliminate um, you know the um, co uh, competitive forces that could could to topple them and I think that's a that's a, a real problem. It's, there's you know Stan Druckenmiller ran Soros for years. He says both parties in America both have given up on capitalism. They've got crony capitalism, a lot of corporate welfare. They'll do anything they needed to feather their beds. And we all know it's happening. I mean, the idea that you can be, you can uh, run for office and you can become a member of the leadership and suddenly you go from very low net worth to you're worth $100 million. Or in some cases, you go from you're worth $100,000 because you have a condo. 
and that and suddenly you're worth 20 million. That, that's bizarre. That's, that's and yet that that continues. So anyway. And when you're outside, you know, there's this parable in economic theory that you have what's called your desires, your preferences, and that becomes your demand. And then the market serves you. But the problem is what you have as preferences or desires is affected by fear. And what you become afraid of is what you see coming downstream. And so do you, as somebody once said, I really like Dante and I really like Shakespeare and I really like Homer, but I study business administration and accounting because I got to get a job. And the, the whole nature of what we are doing is not the market serving our desires. There's a, there's a feedback loop. Our desires are reflected by the structure and the fears and the danger of poverty or being left behind or what have you. And so as this becomes more extreme, as the despair grows, there's a danger to the system. And I always cite my friend and uh, gentleman I admire a great deal who wrote a book called, his name is Martin Wolf at the FT. And he wrote a book about the rise of capitalist, the, the threats to capitalist democracy where, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to come back with the title, but the, uh, the crisis of democratic capitalism. And when I read that book, what I said is, just like in your movie, if left and right are fighting, if things disintegrate, if people are talking about a civil war in the country, then the whole system is disintegrating and the despair that emerges from that can essentially destroy the prosperity of the powerful as well. And at some level, people are sort of saying, when they're playing these plutocratic games that you've been describing, why don't they, like you said, on the super subsidies they're getting, why don't they cut a little bit to the side to make sure everybody's educated or everybody has health care, diminish the fear, diminish the divisiveness, diminish the danger of an authoritarian breakdown in our society? Yeah, it is amazing that there was, there isn't a sense of a long-term strategy. I mean, the way I call it, if you're if you're going if you have the middle classes fading, there are two words to describe a uh, a system where the the upper class elites live side by side with the lower class, with the middle class gone. Two words: banana republic. And banana republics aren't good places to do business. Now, you would think that our corporate leadership would realize, and our financial leadership, and all the big Wall Street bankers, brilliant people, you and I have worked with them. But you would think they would say, you know, it's in our long-term interest to give up something. Not a whole lot, but give up something so that we can nurture the middle class. So they, so they're part, they're, that's our customer base. You know, and uh, we think our customer base is just the elites, but ultimately, it's the 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 these people. If it's an open system, will will rise up and become that top tier. Some of them, but we're just we're we're, we're they, they're kind of like they have no strategy, and Congress isn't providing a strategy to them uh, for them. So it, it's it's very very disillusioning in that sense that we're. Um, but um, anyway, go ahead. One uh, episode in my life, um, I was at Davos and I was going to the dinner parties and hearing some very wealthy and powerful people expressing their fear and their despair. And when I came back from Davos, I mentioned this and they said, have you read Douglas Rushkoff's new book called The Survival of the Richest? And it was about how these people didn't know how to heal things, even though they were the powerful, that things were in such a discord that they were essentially building their own bomb shelters and their own airstrips and thinking of, of basically an escape hatch Sheep in the event of disintegration. In, in, in New Zealand, I get into the 
put the southern oceans yeah. below there so that, you know, if there's a meteor yeah. strike. I know. But, but I found that haunting. The idea that the powerful, the billionaires, can't imagine how to yeah. well, they can off, imagine write the, the ship and get yeah. everybody going. Yeah, they can anticipate the future danger because that's what they do for a living. But yeah. to, to ref, come up with reforms that pre prevent it, either they don't do it or they don't care. But it is, it, it's very, very disillusioning when you think about where we're going. On the other hand, my film, uh, which just, you know, it was just at Tribeca and uh, we just had our, our New York premiere. Um, the general consensus, people are surprised because the title sounds ominous, America's Burning. But the, um, it's quite hopeful, the, the parts of, of the film, because for this reason, and, and as Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, says in the film, America has a history, a very impressive history of resilience. And um, we've come back from a lot of parts. We screwed a lot of things up, but we've come back uh, from our mistakes. And we can, we're probably going to do it again. And uh, we are extraordinary history of, um, uh, of technological leadership. Unless we screw that up, that will probably be our, our strong uh, suit. And um, so, you know, we have a lot to be um, encouraged about if we could figure a way to stop hating each other. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's uh, um, disconcerting. I'm, I'm uh, on, the, on the whole question of, you talked about elites, and um, <clears throat> there's this notion that the elites created the conditions for this 40 years of prosperity, this amazing 40 years. But I kind of look at it uh, a little differently since you know, and I both live through this. You can tell me if you agree with me, but I think a lot of the prosperity that came about, uh, nobody expected it, or at least they didn't expect it in the same kind of dimension that it came. Um, no one expected that in 1981, uh, a guy named Paul Volcker as Fed chairman, would take hyperinflation, you know, and break the back of it with a very short but nasty recession, but break the back of hyperinflation so that you were going from, in some cases, double-digit inflation down to initially five, but I mean, essentially the much lower inflation environment. And that was very good for stocks, very good for the financial markets. Nobody really expected the, so the Soviet Union to collapse, which created a, a defense premium. Nobody said, you know, they, it seemed far-fetched. Um, a little bit like, oh, we're going to defeat inflation very quickly. Nobody thought, gee, Bill Clinton, this guy from Arkansas, is going to be president. And he's going to have like, extraordinarily high productivity growth. You know, you, I, you can say some of the economists might have predicted, but they weren't. No, no one said, "Here's a sure thing." But the the and, and surpluses. Nobody expected that, and nobody expected that you were going to have a change in technology where you could push a button and move money across the world like that. And so, when you did that, you ended up with a suddenly a global financial market instantly almost overnight and that the, the the liquidity of this market but a lot of it would pour into u.s fixed income uh, particularly as we as many of our trading partners that were new particularly china india and, the, and uh, that came on board where they had to re recycle their their um, dollar savings, they, they, they recycle it into U.S. assets. Well, no one said, my God, we're going to have unnaturally low interest rates. And um, in this giant ocean of liquidity, that is, it's, it, that kind of is rewards, the, the, it's like a beauty contest. The, the least ugly contestant in the beauty contest is going to, 
is going to get the rewards in, form, in the form of, of a huge infusion of, of savings that's going to lower their interest rates in, in our case. And, you know, I don't think people sat there and, and, and predicted that. So my, my view is that we got into a situation and if you happen to have the money or you happen to have a stock portfolio, you made huge gains during this period. And as I said before, but it wasn't like this was no one expected a 3,800 percent increase in the Dow over 40 years. But it happened. And I think that's where we have to have a little humility, particularly among financial elites to say, you know, we were given this this gift. Now, we worked hard and we worked 12 hours, 14 hours a day. But the reality is, if we didn't have these conditions, if we had had hyperinflation that just continued, and if we had uh, didn't have a global financial market, we had a much more of a domestic continuation of domestic thing, and all the other developments, we were not, we would not be in the uh, we'd not be in this position we're in today. So have some humility that you won the lottery, you worked hard, that you won the lottery, but that these were unusual times. And so can we really leave half the country out of the party? Now, I will, I will add this. <clears throat> my, my film offers answers. And the, um, but it's not the only answer. And um, I am, uh, I could be completely wrong about things, but. I think we have to have some answers. And when people ask me, what, what is your film really? It's not a traditional documentary, I tell them. It's, it's, it's you know, with, with a, a protagonist and, and you have, uh, you know, the, the two evil, three evil figures, the hero. And all. It's, it's much more of a, of an intellectual statement, a thought piece that says we need to, have a national conversation about where we want the country to go. And that to me is um, what uh, the average person, you should look at this documentary as, as more of a, of a, of a national calling that we, 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 you know, we, we're having this election coming up in, uh, in November. And, you know, we, during this lead up to the election, it's very clear we have a number of problems. Let's call the problems X, Y, and Z. And we're going into an election in which one of two people on January 20th is going to be president of the United States. And it doesn't matter who those people are. We're still going to have X, Y, and Z. And that's why I'm, I decided this film should say – Look, you want to watch the ins and outs of the of the presidential election? Fine. Let's dig deep. Let's go down and discover the roots of this, of what our problems are. What are the root causes of why we hate each other? So what, why do we feel that half the country, particularly the, 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 the blue collar, the working class half, feels cut adrift? They feel neglected. They're full of anxiety. We need to get down and discover that. And that's the nature of this film, as opposed to I'm, we, I'm, we don't get in the tit for tat about who's who's up, who's down. It's really down to this is what we need to be just concentrating on now and, and after the election, because this is a survival of our democracy. We have a lot of threats to our democracy. I certainly, like you, recognize Trump as a as a threat with, when you're talking retribution and all the rest. But I'm thinking, Lord, long term, I'm thinking, let's let's look at this. Let's reverse it and look at it from 30,000 feet. Where is this country going? How can we we're going to be we're going to. My prediction, we're going to be we're going to have a second industrial revolution. That's the Druckenmiller theory. Uh, a, lot, a lot of other people buy this, that we're going to have this revolution that is going to be so extraordinary. We're, it, it's probably begun. It's just not measured uh, properly. But if we move in that way, this, these problems that I've outlined of, a, of a half the country feeling neglected are going to intensify. And the people are going to say, I, wh what's in it for me? 
uh, when, you know, I have to struggle just for groceries and my brother-in-law who works at, uh, you know, at a bank and uh, lives in Palm Beach just had his house go up uh, $3 million in, in value in the last year and who's working at uh, J.P. Morgan. So, I mean, at some point you have to say um, this is not just a, a, a age old quality uh, argument about, you know, equity issues about so this is a bigger issue about sa- saving the kind of system, the de- a constitutional democracy, a constitutional system that we that we 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 all value. Well, there's a famous uh, Sausalito, California, Jungian therapist, psychologist named Edward Jampolsky, and he wrote a book called "Love Is Letting Go of Fear." And the idea, and I'm not talking about romantic love here, the idea of being a kindred spirit with your fellow citizens, being part of America, involves addressing those fears. And whether it's globalization, where the powerful can keep their money offshore, or where your job gets put under pressure because it moves through a multinational company to elsewhere, whether it's climate issues, people are very concerned about the what you might call safety of where they live in many different parts of the planet now. Whether you're talking about the stability of finance, we had a big, you know, one of the reasons people didn't see the big up that you talked about was they were scared in 2008 and 9 with the Lehman crisis. Then 87. And, and then you have an 87 stock market yeah. crash, you're right. Before that, and before that, the savings and loan crisis, right, right at the same, t- roughly the same time. Mm-hmm. So everybody th- felt like they were on a bumpy road, and then all of a sudden it smoothed out and took off. Yeah. But you've, you've got now, as we've talked about, the great potential of AI and technology applied to the medical industry, but everybody's afraid for their jobs in those sectors. And yeah. Are they going to be replaced by computers, etc.? So there's a lot of what you might call structural fear, whether it's globalization or climate or technology or finance. And then, I mean, looking at the global south, the size of the African continent is enormous. If we don't address climate change in the equatorial region, subsistence farming will be burned out. Then what are you going to do with a billion and a half people? There's there these what you might call scenarios of angst are very real, and going back to Jean Kowski, unless we can get rid of the fear, the love, the unity, the right. spiritual democracy will not blossom. I also think you, I, I agree with you entirely, and I think that that fear causes the working class, the middle class, to. Um, you know they got nothing to lose, so they'll 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 pick a candidate who they normally wouldn't support. And I look at some of a lot of um, Trump's vote is is a vote out of fear. It's a little bit like um, no one cares about us, so he he, he may be completely inappropriate for the um, for the presidency. So the guy was you know highly impulsive, not thoughtful enough, uh, and, and all the other. You could just turn on TV and you could catalog all his deficiencies. But it, I, I wonder, why are people voting for this guy? And I, so you start talking to them, and you know what they say? We understand all that. We understand uh, uh, all, his, all the faults. But, but he acknowledges but, their despair. Yeah. He does exactly. step forward and say, the thing's a mess, and I'm exactly. here to fix it. Yeah, there's a guy in the film, Hawk Newsom, who appears in the film, mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter. And Hawk uh, is a friend of mine. We, we uh, go back a n- number of years. And he, uh, so when I'm in New York, we had dinner. And uh, I always learn something from him about what's going on, in, uh, particularly in the Bronx, in the, in the black community in the Bronx. Um, I, as he says, I am not a, a black activist. I, just, I can just tell you what black folk are thinking sitting around the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. So four months ago, he says, uh, he said, what's happening in the Bronx, Hawk? And he said, 
He said, you'd be shocked. This is before all this came out. He said, black males thinking of voting for Trump. I said, that sounds ridiculous. I said, that's absurd. He said, I'm, I think it is. But he said, what they tell me is this. Trump will is the only guy out there. He said, the Republicans, they have no use for. The Democrats, they think, just use them every four years. This is black males, not black females, who are very loyal to the Democratic Party. But black males, and they, he said, they, they, they want to vote. They're considering voting for Trump because he's the only guy there who will stick it to the man. So it's kind of a testosterone macho thing. and uh, But it's something that is powerful because, as you say, the fear is enormous. And that you so you want a guy who will go and stick it to some big corporation if they want to take your job and send it to Mexico. So and not have. Uh, so it, it, it is an interesting development that I think the ruling elites in the uh, in, in, in our country have missed which is the frustration, and that's part of this film's mission, is the frustration of the, of the middle class and the working classes is real. And when we ignore it, we could lose control of the politics. I mean, we could have uh, people say, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a film series called Babylon Berlin. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's, it used to be on Netflix. I think they're coming out with a new updated version, but it's about essentially a guy, a police uh, investigator investigates a murder. He's in Cologne, investigates a murder in, uh, in Berlin in 1929. And um, it's fascinating because in investigating the murder, he, you see Berlin, which was then the cultural leader of Europe, at different layer, levels, both at the bottom among the elites and then the middle class. And um, Everyone in Berlin is um, is scary because you you see this um, you see Germany you see the Weimar Republic um, which then still was in control having no uh, no answers you know there's there's fear of the future was the you know were, they were coming out of a depression but they had no answers they were not providing. That, that kind of stability, that kind of feeling of that, you know, we've got, we, we're going to come out of this. And, um, and um, at the time in 29, the, the brown shirts, the Hitler's party had maybe 3% support. And the socialists, uh, the communist party had a much larger sense of support. And it's just amazing as you're watching this film, which is a fictional film, but you know, within three years, by 32, Hitler was running everything. And uh, fear, as you point out, uh, just the general working class fear that, and, you know, it, was, it wouldn't have been hard to see that Hitler was inappropriate as a, as a monster. But there was, it, it, people do strange things when they're, when they're fearful, particularly if you're fearful because, you don't think your kids are going to have a future or they're going to be starved to death or whatever the, whatever the element is. Well, when you talk about fear, I also want to introduce the fear that politicians have that if they don't get money, they're not going to survive in office. Right. And, well, one, uh, of the, and, one of the surprising things about this film is we talk about how both parties have rigged the the, the system of fundraising where if you are a, um, uh, you, as, a, as a political party, whether Republican or Democrat, you, have, you can raise 335 times the amount allowed uh, as an independent candidate. I mean, they have rigged the system against any independent candidate. So you have these two parties that kind of, posture as if, but they take, they take the complicated issues and of great nuance and they simplify them into, you know, jargon that can be used as one liners in this, in this campaign of raising huge amounts, going 98% negative and just slamming, slamming, slamming as opposed to, you know, so it's hard for an independent to come in and say, 
uh, you know, unless it's, you know, a Bloomberg who is unfortunately an independent without a personality, but to come in and, and, uh, and fight this system. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's probably a, one of the two or three things in, the, in this film that elites express the most surprise at. They have no idea how much the system is rigged by both parties, by colluding by both parties to keep out competition. Which is insane. Look at when I think a, a famous line in the film is by Ken Langone, the founder of uh, of the Home Depot, and he says uh, he holds his hand up like in dismay as he looks towards his face. And he says, "You know, the most qualified people in America don't run for public office." And this is followed up by a statement by David Ignatius of the Washington Post, a good friend of mine, and David agreed to be interviewed, and David said, you know, um, he said, we, you know, we can blame, you can blame the the, uh, the politicians, but ultimately the blame goes to the voters because they were given an opportunity to demand policies that eliminate dirty money, that eliminate manipulation of the party system. We can, you know, we could, if it would just become a, what he calls a lazy citizenry, that we don't put enough in there. We don't, we don't run. We don't show up at, at school board meetings. We don't do the, unless it's certain narrow issues, we, we don't, we, we, we're lazy and we don't have a, a commitment to the country. Um, the it's it, it's um, so you have uh, to me it really comes down to um, whether and I say this at the end of the film whether you put you know um, party before country and uh, in my in my view I think we we put everything before country. I mean, I think I go back and I look at John F. Kennedy saying, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It's so prophetic because he, it's almost like Kennedy could see where we were going, that we were becoming what I say in the film is the cult of the self. Uh, we are enamored of, of uh, our individual needs. We don't, uh, we don't care about community. We don't care about uh the, the the common good we are uh, and and uh, it's just shocking and you can see that in order to get out of this rut we're going to need a very dynamic leader who can communicate that we're all in this together if we're not in this together we're we're screwed and uh, and being in this together means that you will um, you have to sacrifice you know, if you're if you if you're making ten billion dollars a year, you know, but you're in this. I mean, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that we, you know, we're. we're not, this is not just a, 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 you know, a playing field where you win and you're not part of the team. So I, I, I and I, I think that when people see the film, that's why at the end of it they say, yeah, you, you, parts of it scare the crap out of me because you talk about a civil war. If there was a civil war, it's not going to be what the movies talk about it's in the civil war, uh, they, you know, which is a bunch of people beating each other up in the streets, shooting at each other. It's going to be an economic civil war between governors in which each state, each, you know, the red states use their power and their ability to affect supply and the blue states use their power, mostly financial. And that, you know, if we have that, it's, it's rather frightening where we're heading. We're going to have to uh, make some profound decisions about what do we want America to be. And uh, that's, that's, the, that's the game right now. We are, we are, if you go to Washington right now and you went around and said, what, is, what, is, what are you fixated on? What are you thinking about right now? You know what they would say? Something about whether Trump says something stupid or or Biden decides to get in or out, and it's all fine. I just wish that it wasn't a hundred percent. And when I turned on the TV and looked at the news, I wish there'd be like ten or twenty percent that would say, 
here's the long-term game plan. We need to decide how we can fix certain problems so that we can have a stable democracy. And um, I think, um, you know, we don't have that right now. By the way, if you look back at the founders of a, of a country and you look at John Adams, um, he wrote a famous letter to, um, and he said that um, he was worried about the survival of a government that he helped create, the United States government, because he said the way we structured a constitutional democracy is it requires a certain amount of virtue. And um, by virtue means, um, I think they, you know, back then, I mean, a moral, moral kind of grounding. And if, in other words, if you can just lie and lie and lie and then have your media cheerleaders spread the lies, eventually you, uh, the, the system doesn't survive. And that was what he worried about because the, the media back then, I mean, both parties had their media cheerleaders. But his, his argument was you get mob rule. And at that point, it's all over. And I think that's a good warning for Americans. I think everybody ought to read this letter because he was, he said in pretty clear terms, here's the, here's the threat. We're going to lie to each other and we're going to lie over and over again. And one side's going to say that's outrageous lies. And then some of their more extreme elements will say, well, let's lie back. And it just gets to a point where there is no virtue in the system. And I think that's, a, that's the, I argue in the film, that is a huge, huge threat to that. It is. But what I would say in conclusion is that you have taken your time and you have moved away from all the elites in finance and politics that have been your, how we say, your environment. And you stepped forward, given your consciousness of your upbringing and understanding of the instability where we are. And you have done, I'm going to read you a quote from Muhammad Ali. He who is not courageous enough to take risk will accomplish nothing in life. And when I see your film, I see an individual who is being constructive. And I see, I want to congratulate you for that. Ali's most famous poem is considered many years the shortest poem in the world. Me, we. <laughs> we have a pendulum between me and yeah. we. And you, you are pushing yeah. the pendulum towards we. Well, thank you. Towards I, that spiritual democracy, and you are setting an excellent example for elite people who care about the future. Not the bag of money that their child can take to an island, but the community exactly. of our children and grandchildren who want to have what we used to believe was the future of America. So it's funny, uh, Michael Douglas, he's been extraordinarily helpful on this film. And um, he's been asked recently, so, um, you know, you could do all kinds of things. Why did you pick this project out? But here you are. He flies in from Europe to do our, our New York premiere. He yes. does a lot of press. People have seen him all over talking about this film. And he said, uh, why, do I, why am I helping Dave? Why I'm helping him is my brother. He said, I'm a Democrat. My brother's on the other side. And he said, uh, we don't speak. It's insane. You know, we don't speak. And, you know, even though we have little differences, it's like we're, it's, and, and I would, sus I would argue that if you read the, uh, uh, the writings of George Carlin, the comedian of 30 years ago, you'd be stunned how much he pegged what's, what's happening now. Because he said, you know, there are a lot of people who are making a lot of money, gaining a lot of power, keeping us divided so that brothers don't speak. 
you know, and um, that's, you know, that's why it, um, he said, look, I, I want to I want to address this. I, he said, but when you put when you get down to a personal matter, yeah, this is not right. I mean, we can have disagreements and all the rest. This is not right. And um, if you are um, a Democrat listening to this and you or a Republican listening to this, you have to decide which part of the American economy you're on. Are you part of the 80 percent that hasn't lost its mind over just such intense hatred for the other side that you just you just want to spit every time you think? Or are you part of the you're part of that side that says I could never, you know, I don't care what my brother says. He's on that side. I'll never be forgiven. And and it's that that kind of mentality. And, and we they, people need to decide. I think there's an 80 percent of the of the American people. And it's why I'm an optimist that are saying, look, um, I'm. You know, I may not agree with everything the other side is, but I agree we need to sit down and we need to talk. And if we can sit down and talk, we probably find common ground. And um, if you look at in, instead, what are our, our political system, as, as George Carlin says, what are, what are all the money interests do? They want us to concentrate on our differences, you know, not on things that we can agree on. We just saw the president of the United States earlier in his administration, pass an infrastructure bill with Republican help. That they should be championing that not as a Biden victory or a Republican victory. They should a bipartisan victory. Then, if we can do this, we can do another dozen, and maybe save the country. And that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I think that it really goes down to: Do you are you are you part of that 20 percent of haters that just they're so consumed with it? Either you're making money off it or gaining power off it, or you're a pawn of people who are gaining money and power versus the other 80 percent who don't watch cable news. They don't watch. You know, they, all they know is they want to get the news somewhere and they say, yeah, I don't agree with this, this, this. But that doesn't mean they're evil. And I will sit down with them and tell them why I don't agree and see if there's any common ground. And I think that's the first step. Well, what I would say, as I've watched and I, our audience can tune in online, Michael Douglas, who his friend, Shep Gordon, when I described what I'm about to tell you, yeah. he wrote me an email and said, yes, he's a special person. Yeah. Michael Douglas went on Colbert's show. And the two of you did Morning Joe together, and then he went on with Whoopi Goldberg and The View. And the energy that his presence and your presence created among these people in the media, was it was almost like a wake-up call, seeing their enthusiasm, because you were illuminating what might be called unconscious angst. And these people joined the energy very quickly. And I saw that at the at the screening last night, which I attended, and uh, I, I want to congratulate you. Yeah, I was. For I was. Thank you very much. Moving in the place, yeah. I was where uh, we all need the medicine. You this. Yeah. You can say America's burning, but I would call this movie American Medicine. Yeah. Well, that's a good. That's a good title. I. Um, <laughs> so, I. Uh, you know, when you do a movie, you. you it's collaborative. And so I had yeah. a long list of titles. You provided some others. A lot of friends provided titles. And like, there was a long list. And uh, most of them at the top, three quarters of the way down, or 80% of the way down, maybe, um, were very clever, but very abstract. And um, then at the bottom, they had these vivid ones, like America's Burning, you know, and... Um, but they, it wasn't clever, probably overstated. So I took it to Barry Levinson, Academy Award winner. He's the executive producer of our film. Yes. And I said, what do you think of these? And he said, well, have, Dave, have you ever seen the movie called Dangerous Marine Life along the Cape Cod Coast? 
So no, I don't think I missed that one. He said, well, they call that movie Jaws. <laughs> he said, <laughs> yep. he said people, don't, people don't remember abstract titles. They remember concrete titles. <laughs> and he said, and, you know, he said, don't let people tell you, oh, that's too scary. Or you, you know, if you talk about a dangers from a civil war, it's too scary. He said, I'll tell you why. He said, uh, when Martin Scorsese uh, was doing the movie Goodfellas, they had a screening of about 300 people. And uh, 20, 25% of the people walked out in the first 10, 15 minutes. Said, this was outrageous. It's way too violent. It's too, this is one of the big earners of all time. One of the movies that remembered when people say name a dozen mm-hmm. movies. You know, they missed it. And he said, we live in troubled times. So if you, if your movie outlines this, there's no reason to back off. He said, but what's great about your film is it's optimistic. It shows there is a way out of this. It doesn't say I have the exact way, but it says here's a way. Others will add to it, maybe subtract from it, but it is the way. And that's kind of the mentality that we've had on this thing. And you're exactly right, uh, Michael Douglas is one of the great heroes. He really, I, I don't think, uh, if he ever came to Washington, um, I think he would just be too nice a guy because he's such a genuine guy. He's just not a not a good liar. <laughs> and uh, he's, it's, he's really a terrific person, terrific human being. Well, I think we ought to conclude here, but I, uh, once again, I want to congratulate you. Bob Dylan had a song called It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding. <laughs> and, and he said, darkness at the break of noon, shadows even the silver spoon, the handmade blade, the child's balloon, eclipses both the sun and moon. To understand, you know too soon, there's no sense in trying. Yeah. Pointed threats, they bluff with scorn, suicide's remark are torn. From the fool's gold mouthpiece, the hollow horn, plays wasted words, proves to warrant. The he not busy being born is busy dying. David, I think having known you for years, you're living a second life now, and you're busy being born. You're not busy dying. And I want to thank you for the example that you set for all of us, and I want everybody to see America's Burning. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.